Welcome everyone to the opening. Together we have created a place that is safe and inviting and more than anything will bring you hope. My name is Fran and I am a rapid transformational therapy practitioner. My beautiful co-host Marina is a clinical hypnotherapist specializing in rapid transformational therapy. I'm coming to you from beautiful Northern Alberta, Canada, and Marina is in Southern Alberta and Calgary. And we love what we do. I have almost finished my career as a 34 year veteran elementary school teacher. And in three more days, I will be able to do rapid transformational therapy full-time, a passion of mine. And so together we have created a space where hope is happening. And so if you're a first time viewer or if you have visited us many times, welcome, welcome. Marina, we are extremely excited to have a guest today from the other side of the world. Can you please introduce our guest? Yes, thank you so much, Fran. And we are very happy today to have Louisa Burden as our guest. I've been on Louisa's case for a while to come on the show, so I'm very happy that she's here today. Louisa is the owner of I Heart Me, where she guides teenagers and their parents, mainly mothers, to thrive, to stay on purpose. She specializes in helping teenagers connect with their true self, by overcoming limitations like anxiety, low motivation, low confidence or self-esteem and reigniting self-love and self-belief. Louisa grew up in South Africa, mainly in the bush felt, in a place where apparently they have the most dangerous snakes. So um, even though she never really encountered one, well, I grew up in another part of South Africa and I encountered a few <laughs> Um, she studied somatology, and Louisa, you're going to have to tell us more about that, um, which is the human anatomy and physiology. And for two decades, she worked in that. And then because she, Louisa, has such a big heart, and I know Louisa very well, so I'm just going to tell you my, my version of this. She used to make people beautiful, and then she switched and she trained as an RTT therapist. And now she's making beautiful people from the inside out. I know that Louisa's husband says that Louisa is making healthy adults one teenager at a time. And I love that. So Louisa lives in Dubai today. She has two wonderful teenagers. And I always tell Louisa that her children are so lucky to have such an amazing mother. So here you are, Louisa. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me as well. It's a wonderful introduction. <laughs> so this is going to be interesting because you're going to have two of the same accents here today. Yeah. <laughs> so Louisa, tell us your story. Um, what led you to do rapid transformational therapy and um, coming from somatology? So Tell us about somatology. What is your journey? What brought you from there to where you are today? Um, I uh, it's well way back. My uh, I've always cared quite a bit, and I think caring for animals, caring for people, and just seeing happiness everywhere is is something that is still inside of me. And um, my mother told me she said so from a very early age. I always said. I want to make people beautiful. I want them to feel good about themselves. And um, it so led that I studied somatology, which is the study of an, uh, human anatomy and physiology. And there's many directions you can take into it, but I went um, into like beauty therapy. So it's massages, facials, manicures, pedicures. And as I was working with people, they come in very drained, low in life. They They feel stressed and when they walk out they walk out with a smile it's it's a form of self-care that they gave themselves such a gift but then I saw what it what it did for them and there was always something in the back of my mind that alarm that put up alarms and I I didn't know what it was and just one day about four years ago I stumbled across Marisa Pierre um and um rtt and i mentioned it to my husband my husband goes like this is your next move 
And so it led me to go to London, study RTT. And now I see the value of helping people overcome those limitations, which is the subconscious mind and especially the teenagers. So um, I'm one of the crazy people that likes teenagers and um, I feel bad for them because maybe it is something that that kind of started off for me as well. A happy teen, um, happy adult, I suppose. And so it just took off from there. I just stayed with the teenagers. It's interesting, Louisa, you moved from the outer to the inner. And um, I love massage. Like, I just love it. And hair, right? When I'm getting my hair done, these people, I tell everything to. I think there's something about touch. Uh, and I, you've probably found it too. Like, you just start telling your all your stuff that's going on in your life. I mean, I, I'm sure my hairdresser and my massage therapist knows me better than a lot of my friends do. But um, I've heard also that with physical touch, there's energy movement and you get some of the blocks out, right? And maybe that has helped move emotions as well. Um, have you found in your practice with RTT the same thing, like the energy starts to move and maybe some emotions start to start percolating up? And um, I know it's, I know I have my own stories, but I'd like to know about yours with teenagers, because as adults, we so carry so much burden, right? We carry so much baggage that just keeps on piling up. With teenagers, they have that in a different way. So what have you found with teenagers? What is their burdens? What are what are their emotions that come out with RTT? Um, a friend, it is they you, at a young age, they do have a lot of emotions bottled up. And the teenage phase is, is a very misunderstood and misinterpreted time. It's almost like we see them as adults, but they can't be functioning like adults because of how the brain develops. So when the brain develops from the back forward, by the time they get to teenage phase, they still don't have logic and reasoning and 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 good um, understanding of things. It takes time. It's a slow movement system still. And they do silly things because they do everything out of fun. They are, They crave connection. So it's connection with a peer. So they step out of their circle of their parents to move towards peer. Why? Because they need to, they intrinsically know that these people who is the same age as them will take them into their future. So it's less about the parents now, more about the peer. So they do everything out of fun. They do everything out of emotions, really. Um, and still they do need this holding hand of their emotions and to understand those emotions and to move forward. Otherwise they do bottle it up. They don't tell their parents. And a lot of times they're misguided by their friends or even you know the internet, social media. And then that's where those seeds start sprouting and they take it all the way into the adulthood. So um, it is a very, very emotional phase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think the physical development, if you look at that alone, um, the brainwave development, it's not yet adult, but it's not child anymore. So it's really, I think, a very sensitive age. And for the right guidance, you can really set them up for tremendous success. And as you are talking, I'm thinking back, and I, I say this really with a lot of respect, but thank God my children are adults because especially my one son was really pushing all the buttons when, when he was a teenager. And today we can laugh about it because he did turn out to be a phenomenal adult and very well balanced, but it it was a difficult time. It So you say that you, you work with mothers um, more than fathers, I, I guess. How do you help the parents of a teenager? Well, that's when they want to be helped. Uh, a lot of times it is to help them to know their teenagers differently from what they see them because they saw them coming from babies and toddlers. So they have to shift their focus about their 
the team being an adult now or becoming an adult and we we want to hold on to our children but we 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 don't understand how the holding on shifts as well um and then um guiding them to how their teenager think how they interpret the things different how they talk differently how they understand things differently helps them to be kinder and more accommodating towards the teens and the the fights often come because they want to have their own independence and they want to practice how to be themselves um when they when they leave the house so it's a safe zone really for them to to practice to be an adult this this time of being a teenager but we we like to hold on to them and tell them still what to do louisa um i teach 10 year olds and so that you know there were about at least two solid years of pandemic right, where there was so much social restriction, where they weren't allowed to do after school activities, where they weren't allowed to, there was just so much restriction that um, we're finding uh, in my grade and everything below up to a certain age, a real lack of um, social skills, real lack of social skills. So this bump of children that have moved up into their teenage years have you noticed anything in your practice where the pandemic has really uh, done uh, a number, I would say done a number on our children because there there's two solid years of social growth that wasn't allowed, wasn't, we just couldn't do it because of the lockdowns we, you know, that were happening, parents, teachers, whatever. What do you notice in your practice? Uh, yeah, that is it is something that comes through very strong. A lot of them say, oh, I have social anxiety now, or I have anxiety, or I, I don't know if I'm good enough, or that I'm a good friend, or um, they don't know how to interact properly. Uh, and I think it's not just so just the pandemic i think their and habit to be online was created in, intensely fiercely um so i do get that um because it is the disconnection that they had like you say fran it's the the physical connection and we we have two connections that we have to nurture it's the physical connection and the emotional connection this is us as beings and um, for children, they need this connection socially, as you say, also from, you know, going into their teenage phase. So by by 10 year old, they're already so um, aware of the people around them and they start judging themselves. It's like a different set of eyes opening up. They start judging themselves from their friends and then they start learning how to act within those circles. And because they didn't have that handy or at hand for them, you know, over the pandemic, it is something that they are missing out on. And then they just go forward as that. So it is, it is sad, but it is, it's definitely coming through as anxiety really in many forms. Well, I just think back of when I was a child, we did not have a device in our hands. And we did not have online gaming. We did not communicate with people over WhatsApp or Facebook or social media. And um, I think that was um, 10 years ago in my life. That was one of the most difficult things for me to raise a teenager who was now in that where most of my, my younger son, most, most of his communication was online. And I saw such a big shift in him when he started to game and his academics started to go down the drain and and his communication with me really suffered uh, because I was the enforcer. And um, it was a very difficult time to the point where I actually went to see a psychologist and I said, help. And she, she said to me, oh, no, there's nothing you can do. And I was really upset. Now there's a lot of of stories about gaming addiction. So I almost want to ask you because you are now in that phase where you have a son that age as well as a daughter that's that's a young teenager. Um, how would you help a mother 
like where I was 10 years ago? I would say um, to give space and understanding is one of the bigger things. Um, my son, him, he loves his online gaming as well. And there's definitely boundaries um, that as I give the respect of giving him time to play online, he gives me back that respect of, of not saying yes or no to, to things that we, we ask. Like if we want to go out, it is a yes, because that's with the family time. So we set up rules, we set up boundaries. And addictions in teenagers is very, very easy to form. And when they don't find connection, they're going to find connection somewhere else. So a mother that invites her child and they love invitations constantly. It's not asking them once. It's still a child asking them over and over, come out with a, for a coffee with me, do something fun together, something that they like, not what we like. Um, and get that connection back with them, then they would easier, e more easily say yes to going out because they know there's fun there as well. So forming a connection with them where it is possible, where they allow you, uh, that that helps quite a bit because they, they seek connection. We are driven for connection. As we all know, we are driven connection. And if we don't, they say, um, a person can only have one master. And so I say a child can only have one master. It's either the parent or the peer. If we don't form that connection with them, if we don't nurture that connection and give them the space to, to be free within those boundaries. So if we say you can play for, for one hour this day or three hours that day and occasionally give him a night out to play the whole night, then we're not the bad parents. We still give. We don't. We don't hold back. And I'm interested in knowing if you've ever experienced, because I have, uh, teenagers who refuse to go to school. Like they just refuse, and uh, the parents are working, and they have to get out of the house to go to work kids just refuse to go to school and they're 12, 13, 14, 15. I mean, it's, I, it's beyond uh, my scope of capacity to understand uh, because my, I was raised differently, but have you experienced that? And have you worked with families that are going through that as well? Because the three of us understand what happens to you if you, if you have become, have a lifestyle like this, but have you ever worked with parents who are so struggling because their child just will not, will not go to school, too afraid, too anxious, too whatever? Yeah, um, it, it, it has happened with me. Yes, I have not just once, but a few times where they don't want to go to school. And it's really getting to the bottom of why marina you said it so you said it earlier but they need a mentor as well they need somebody who is neutral that will listen to them in their language and in their way of speaking uh, to understand why it is and often they don't speak to their parents they won't disclose everything to their parents it's not because the parents are doing something right or they're doing something wrong it's just because you don't tell your mom everything. I know I never did. I still don't. Um, and a lot of kids do. A lot of kids don't. And they don't tell their parents everything. But it's to get down to the root of why it is that they don't go to school. It's maybe that they feel anxious. Maybe because they feel pressured. Maybe because they are being um, bullied. Maybe because the, there is something going on at the school that that makes them fearful or they just don't want to. I've had a case study where the child just don't want to go to school, not motivated to go to school. And in the end, it turned out that it's not really her not wanting to school because it's not fun there. It's the parents enforcing it, going, they are they are like the, the, the feeders. It's like, if she doesn't want to go to school, then it's okay. She doesn't have to go to school. And then it's a hard case to handle because then you have to work with the parents as much as you work with the children or the child because 
the parents have to be the enforcer of good habits as well. So there's many reasons why they don't go to school and getting to why it is and then helping them to move through it with, you know, helping, it depends on what the situation is. Well, I'm thinking a lot of, um, again, in comparison, when I grew up, um, in in today's society, it doesn't matter where you live, there are so many single parents. I was a single mom myself. And that comes with a entire new range of issues, availability, stress. So tell me, what is your experience with that? Um... I feel that family dynamic is the most important um, part of being. Um, having a mom and a dad is a, a it's a it's a powerful giving. In some cases, Marina, like your case, it's just not possible, and it's hard for a mom to be a mom and a dad, and it's most unfortunate because we know the bearing of how hard it is to have children as a mom and now to have children as a mom and a dad as well is is um it's very hard um in that scenario i would say working with a mom and with the child brings about a lot of healing in that small circle where the father is not present or let's say when the mom's not present and there's many things that helps them and i love the internal world i love the i say this we are spiritual beings that moves in a vessel so the body is the vessel because one day the body is going to go we hope it's close to a hundred the body is going to go but still this there's an unchangeable part within us so fran has a beautiful spirit Marina has a beautiful spirit. And then I say, I have a beautiful spirit. And we all have different bodies and we move in these bodies. And when spirits blend, like when, and this is probably, I don't know if we can go to this woo-woo side, but when they blend as a mom, as a child, a son, a daughter, and they they support each other, it becomes a very, very strong blended um um connection and then anything is possible in that connection and marina i know you for a very long time and you were very successful even through those broken pieces and we we want to be a peaceful mom so i, I would play i said we all have broken pieces within us and we raise our children with those bro broken pieces so we are we have to be peaceful moms being p-i-e-c e peaceful so we have to put our pieces together like a beautiful kintsugi plate or cup with gold and um, threads in between so we become more valuable and through that we raise our children so it's very much possible and you are a testimony mariana of how possible it is fran i don't know your story but i'm sure that you have a beautiful story working with children as well like <laughs> it is wonderful yeah fran was a single mom as well wow Oh, hats off for you. Hats off, hats off. Thank you. So yeah, we all have our own stories, right? We have our own stories. And um, I think part of the, 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 the gold within RTT, you talk about the, taking these broken little bits of us and and putting gold in between. I think that uh, RTT really is kind of a gold that you put in between the pieces, right? Because when you do realize your own, your own stuff uh, and acknowledge it and work towards healing yourself, working towards healing your own little person inside that got broken because of whatever happened within our own lives, we're that much stronger, we're that much more capable of understanding and being compassionate and uh, just being more loving towards everyone, whether that's our children, whether that's people we encounter, whether it's the teenager that flips you one on the side, you know, because there is that inside us. So we, you know, we, we respond if someone does something 
that is inappropriate, rude, whatever, there's that part of us that's responding back so quickly and getting offended and and taking that personally when it, it's really not about us at all. It's what's happening within that other person. So um, I myself, I have found that with RTT, I can understand better. I can understand people, even though I don't know your full story, Louisa, and I don't know, you know, I don't know Marina's full story. I have that part within me that can still uh, respond in a more compassionate way because I know that everybody's got a story. Everybody does. Yeah, and uh, we can we can use that story for us though. So it. But what we do is we become the victim and we use it against us. And um, stopping that momentum that it's taken really helps to start off putting those pieces together. Like you said, and it's so beautiful what you say, um, Fran, is once we start putting those pieces together, and it's happened for me, um, I felt very broken for a very long time because I misunderstood so many things um, since I was young. And um, when I started piecing myself together, creating peace within, it overflowed into my whole house. I didn't have to do much, but with the help of RTT, everything started changing for me. And you see the world different on the outside as well. You see well, when something happens at school, we will work it around whatever happens. Um, let's say a scenario when my daughter happened once, and it happens with some clients as well, where something w happens against them, somebody slaps you or pushes you off the stairs or so forth. Yes, it is something that's going on in that person, and they, they're moving from that weakness within them trying to feel better on the outside and describing it that way and allowing, let's say, my it is a story that my daughter, it happened to my daughter. She was slapped in the face by somebody she thought was a friend. Mm -hmm. And it is not something nice to experience. And it is something that we deal dealt with with the school. But with her, there was an emotional setting in that many questions comes up what is wrong with me why do they do that to me and so these pieces breaks a little bit more it shatters more and it pushes her down in what she thinks of herself this we call self-worth i'm and then it becomes am i worthy of having friends am i worthy to stand up for myself so there's many things that starts to develop within her around the self-worth part and for me to explain to her how it came from the other side, that person is not a good person. That person, well, not a good person, but there must be something going on in that person for that for her or him. It was in my daughter's case, a friend. So it was from her to turn around and slap you through the face. It's easy to say, oh, it was just a joke or I, I just made a joke. But still, it was a violation of my daughter's private space and for her then to realize it, it, it came from a weak point so she knows that she can stand up strong again and she did after that I was very proud of her somebody said something against her and she just turned around and said you're not supposed to say that and the, and the person was taken aback um, and she stood up and then slowly but surely that started growing onto her called confidence so she learned her, she taught herself she learned how to be confident with herself and that's called self-love I love all the selves and that's amazing I am yeah. um, I also think you know that especially teenage girls these days they they get such pressure to look a certain way and if they don't they literally online and everywhere they go they start to feel well I'm not I don't look like Taylor Swift so there must be something wrong with me and I'm pretty sure you see a lot of that yeah it is the misinterpretation and then the misunderstanding it's um it's sad because the, the, 
when I show them a picture of, let's say, a Kardashian, when she's in makeup and she's out of makeup, they don't see those pictures, but they are out there because people want to go to the negative side as well. They want to show when they look bad and so forth. They want to show when they're at their worst as well. So they, they are, there are those pictures available and to help them to understand through a different perspective of how the world looks like on the other side of these moment by moment, we call it, I think it's safe to say in this, uh, in our in our talk here, the Kodak moments, because we all know the Kodak. It's just a blip in time. It's a shot in time. It's not a moving thing. It's not minutes. It's a second in time. And they judge themselves on that second. So I can take a picture of you when you felt your very best. And that's also a second. And I can put that online and people will think you're amazing. But yet, you know, your story in the back of that camera in what happens every single day. And it's just for them to see the picture differently because they only look from it from one way. Um, so, yeah. That's interesting. It's a realization I had this week um, making content video. Um, I deleted a few because I'm like, oh, no, you can see every wrinkle and every whatever. And then afterwards, I'm like, I could actually go and retrieve them from my delete folder because um, I'm like, what's wrong with you? Because if I'm going to wait for perfection until I put something out there, I'm never going to put anything out there because I'm not perfect. I am a grandmother. I'm I'm allowed to look like it. So um, it's just embracing the self. And so I'm making this more about adults and not me right now. But I think that is really something so relevant because we are, we are being pushed in a direction where we have to filter the way we look we have like even on zoom there's a there's an option to filter the way we look I turned mine off like no no I don't want my clients to show up and not recognize me I still want to be me but I think for teenagers the pressure to filter even that Kodak moment is huge so not owning who they really are and just embracing who they are um warts and all it doesn't matter really and like you yeah. say so beautifully Louisa it's that inner part of us that's the real important thing yeah they are driven to fit in mm -hmm. they that's the they have to find this tribe that they're going to move on with they have to because they know they're moving away from their parents and they're going to find their own independence somewhere, but they need to still plug in with somebody else. So, uh, or, or another group. And it, it's, you say it's your videos, Marina, but it's come a long way. It's come from your teenagers, maybe, or even younger, where there was so much judgment that was given unto you that you self judge. You start judging who you, how you look because you need to present yourself as perfect. And perfection is born because it's it's shown to us that we're not enough. You you didn't study enough or you weren't good at what happened. Um, I don't know why I got a C or I don't know why I failed this test. But did you study? Uh, yeah, I studied. But then you should have got more. Should have, would have, could have. But it happened in the past where it, it should come out of love saying like, okay, we see you stumble and fall. Let's pick it up. This is what we did when they were smaller. So when we start off, it's all about physical um, development. So we help them. We hold their hands. They they start walking. We help them. We show them, don't pull this over. It's going to fall. Um, walk around that way because that's safer. But when they get to teenagers, we don't hold the emotional hand. By saying it's okay, um, those people will say that. It's okay, these things will happen. And give them the space to understand all 34,000 uh, feelings. We have six basic emotions, but we have connected to that 34,000 emotions. Unfortunately, only a third is good emotions. Mm -hmm. And only <laughs> it's only about 3,000 emotions or feelings that's listed in the dictionary so we have so much to feel but to make it okay for them and if they are geared to fit in they're going to want to to fit into those who who makes them feel good 
And if it is those that get judged, so I get often that it is about the fear of disappointment or being disappointed and the fear of failure because you can't, you have to do so well all the time. It's a lot of pressure that's uh, that's given to them and it stacks. Since they were young, you have to start writing well. You color in the lines. Um, stay in this circle, in this block, in this square. Don't, don't this, don't that. And then it stacks all the way up to where they start feeling these emotions more. And then they function out of fear and disappointment. Yeah. And, um... I, I like what you talked about belonging, right? There are feelings of you, you, you belong to your family when you're little, and then you start belonging within different types of peer groups. And then you start pulling away into a belonging with uh, a big social group in, in the teenage years. But when you really feel like you don't belong anywhere, that I believe is the real place of uh, where where they start to implode right where they start to just feel like not good enough not good enough there because mom's always criticizing how I look not not criticize uh, not fitting in here because I'm not athletic enough not fitting in here because I'm not academic enough not fitting in here because I'm not cool enough um, that sense of not being able to belong anywhere um I think it's so important that um, teenagers, children, everyone really gets a, a handle on where these feelings are coming from and why. Like if we can understand ourselves, we can we can do that in our lives. We can move through our lives so in such a healthier way and impact the people that we end up having relationships with, right? Whether it's our own children or whether it's siblings or spouses to really understand ourselves yeah and it starts with that inner circle but it's that most intimate inner circle i always draw like a bullet eye and then a lot of circles around it so it looks like it's a ripple that expands out and that very very inner circle is really me it's me and my inside, how I think about myself. That's why I say I love the self, is what I think about me. If I, if I don't have me, who, who do I have? And then that, if you reach that part where you don't even love yourself, then that's a loss. And it's a sad loss. And the next circle is those closest to you. It should be mom and dad. It should be like the home environment. But every person differs. And it's so interesting always when I say, and then who's the next circle up? Some will go, oh, mom's there and a sibling is there. Where's dad? No, not in that circle. Okay, let's move on. And dad don't appear in any circle. Maybe the seventh circle, then dad appears. Or maybe dad don't. Or it is, yes, it's mom and dad. They even want to come into the very bullseye circle. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> that's the, that's your little circle so let's put them in the second one and then when um and then it can be like maybe boyfriend is in the very next circle because that is who's closest to them then and so they interchange and we as we have as they evolve those circles will differ but it's the inner circle that very bull's eye circle that shouldn't change you can't place yourself in circle number 10 um so it is your it's 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 the the most important circle is the me circle because i if i don't have me i cannot be well if there is one last thing you can say to parents of teenagers or to teenagers themselves uh, an expression of hope what would you say, Louisa? Oh, my goodness. There's so much. <laughs> um, um, no, no teenager is a lost case. It's because they lost themselves. 
Um, it's interesting that I'm getting a little teary. I know I have no understanding why. It's probably because I have such an infinite connection to them that um, I feel bad that they are that they are so misinterpreted. It is it's a vulnerable time for them, and we start nurturing teenagers when they are preteens. We have to give them that space. We can't just let them be. And I'm a mother as well. I understand. You live your child's life for a very long time until they can do it themselves. So you're the one thinking about when to go to bed, when to when to bathe them, when they need to um, when they need to eat. And then at some point they become more self sufficient um, in their body that they can get their own water and maybe you can teach them to make their own food, but that's not where it stops. We have our children until the day that we say goodbye. That's when we have our children. Marina, you know that. And our children becomes a second blessing of having a grandbaby. And my mother has a, um, she has a, a fridge magnet that I bought her. It's funny that says, I didn't, if I knew, I love my grandchildren so much. I would have had them first, which is interesting. <laughs> but it's because it's because you 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 quiet down. You relax so much. So relax, quiet down. They're not here to fight you. They're here to get an understanding of how it would be to be an adult. And it's such a long road to walk. They only a teenager for this time. Help them through it. Give them that connection. If they 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 do come out of their hiding space um, and they do come out for dinners, sit down at the table and have dinner with them. If you speak, it's okay. If you don't speak, it's okay. At some point, they will. Um, it's it's interesting. I've been nagging a friend of mine for a while and said, just go out, have coffee, go out, have coffee. And so it ended up that husband went out and had coffee and go like the most profound experience ever. Um, he didn't stop talking. He just went da -da 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 the whole time. And I couldn't get anything out. And I go like, yeah, because they have so much to talk about, but they want to talk about their world. And they will, be, will become your world. You just need to wait for them to get there. Then you can speak cars and mechanics, and you can speak about budgets, and you can speak about houses and buy houses, because you need to give them that space to talk their language, and they do have a different language. Um, and it's a short time, but when you lose them there, it's going to take a while to get them back. And the, the connection is a little less, because they have one foot out of that circle that's closest to you. That's okay, but they keep on coming back. Maybe it is to get everything out of your fridge, but still they're in your house, which is a good thing. <laughs> you can replenish the fridge. So having a baby is like having a puppy. Having a teenager is how, about having a, a cat. Why do I say that? I love that saying. It's because a puppy is cute and they sleep and you can feed them and they 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 come and they 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 are around you all the time. And a teenager, they hiss at you. They bring the nails out. They don't want to do anything with you. They go to their, their place, their hiding space, their hibernation space all the time. But they come out for food. And it's okay. Every time you get them to come out for food, it's those small little times that will get them to come back home because a cat always returns back home. It doesn't matter where you go and dump them. They come back scared, but they come back home. <laughs> it's because there's food there. So just... Maybe a big tip is to parents just always have food in your house. <laughs> but don't forget about the teenager. They're not lost. They need you. They need you until they say it's okay. And also, if they say, I can't wait to leave the house, applaud. They have to feel that way. If there's somebody that comes in and says, I never want to leave the house, I want to ask the questions why, because then it is that maybe we, we need to work on a few things. They need to have this drive to go and do it for themselves. It shows that they are thinking and working on that independent part of theirs. Because if they say, I can independently now 100% do it myself, then you know 
your job is kind of done. They will still come back home. So it's just to nurture them through a phase of their brain development that takes up a very big part of your of your mental or of your brain, your mental functioning space. So it's just to help them to move through this. It's weird, it's odd, but it's a it's a wonderful time. It's actually so funny. Sometimes we wonder with a ha ha, and sometimes we wonder whether oh no, you shouldn't have. <laughs> but all the while they learn, they learn and grow, <laughs> and then they go. Mm -hmm. oh, that was absolutely profound. I so love that analogy of the puppy and the cat. <laughs> it really made me love Louisa. Thank you so much for bringing your passion and your beautiful heart to us, to that very important misunderstood phase in a person's lives. And good job on guiding them and their families so masterfully and bringing your beautiful heart and your passion to what you do. And to us today, it was wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you, friend. Thank you, Marina. And how do we get a hold of you? Our viewers, I, I'm sure, are entranced uh, with your knowledge. So, so what is your website? How can, how can people get a hold of you? Thank you, friend. Um, my website is iheartme.ae. So it's just written at iheartme.ae. Um, email is welcome at iheart um, welcome at iheartme.ae. And then Instagram is iheart underscore ae, and Facebook is iheart.ae. So, so iheartme.ae for Facebook and iheartme underscore ae for Instagram. Yeah. Excellent. We will link that definitely to the video as well and um, post it for you. So thank you so much again for being here. Thank you for everybody tuning in today and listening to us. And if you like us, please subscribe and we will see you next time. Thank you.